Welcome to the Steven Universe Vlogs from us, who are Slider and Mangalava. Hey, yeah. So yeah, uh, the new episode will air in like a week. I'm pretty sure. So before that happens, uh, before we start doing vlogs with the actual new episodes, I think we should go over our thoughts on the series as a whole. And like I imagine they'll be much fresher in your mind because you just blitz through the whole yeah series, the whole yes it would uh, so uh, well that might uh, I guess I'll start by saying Steven Universe is not quite my favorite series of all time but it is it might be the series I've gotten the most emotionally attached to at least it's at least it's, in terms of how consistently I've been emotionally attached to it. Like, this is one of those series where people say feels a lot, and they were completely right to do so. And then some. I feel like it moves from feelings to feels when it's as if, you know, you are physically... It's, you know, like, I feel like the phrase hitting you right in the feels implies that some physical part of you has been harmed by the emotional impact. You know, and that's what this show does a lot. So basically, frail people should not watch this show for their own safety. <laughs> Makes sense to me. And it does a good job of building up to it, both an over overall arcs and just 11-minute stories. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to divide this into sections so that we have a clear idea of what we're talking about at all times. So, okay, how about we both start with how we started... Uh, watching the series, uh, you go first. Okay, I will honestly admit, I started watching at the end of season one because I just all of my social media exploded at the season finale and um, canon lesbians. And this was not long after the... I think this was either around the same time as or not long after the end of book four of Legend of Korra, which... You know, I honest to God cried with happiness that Korra's endgame partner was Asami. You know, that is just such an incredible... Even if they weren't allowed to kiss on screen, that is such an incredible leap forward for Western cartoons that I honest to God cried. So when I saw this, I'd been seeing it, you know, people talking about it for a while, and eventually decided, okay, maybe I'm going to check this out. Everyone says it's amazing. And, you know, fell in love with the characters within about three minutes into the first episode and just kept watching through it and like it, it was one of those things where I kept thinking it couldn't possibly be as gay as everyone said it was and it was gayer and it was beautiful <laughs> and yes. yeah again they they still they still know on the lips kissing between Ruby and Sapphire but it, but they're yeah, allowed to kiss I, literally anywhere else basically yeah I mean I, I will probably rant about this at length later but I, I am partitioning that off for a later thing just you know that was what first got me into it it is not it is by far not the only reason to watch this cartoon you know it's just the the animation is beautiful and the characters are just so lovely and so well written and so well crafted I mean few few side characters aside that aren't particularly well handled but you know your main set are absolutely fantastic so, you know, came for the lesbians, stayed for the amazing characterization and adorable freaking animation. And amazing world building as well. Yes. So, uh, what about you? Well, I, I, I know I bugged you to watch it, but... <laughs> well, the, the weird thing is that I weirdly, just entirely coincidentally, I did end up... And this was, like, this feels like one of the last times I actually watched TV, but I actually by accident, ended up watching the first two episodes when they aired. Which was interesting. Um, at the time, I thought it didn't super grab me exactly, but I did find it, like, very unique. Like, I, I got the feeling it was doing some different things just based... Especially on the second episode, it was like, this is not... This is a bit different from what I expect from normal cartoons. I think particularly because of like the art scenes and the anime influence and the relative seriousness of it all. It's like I, I don't remember ca cartoons being this story driven when I was a kid, and I don't know if I just watched too many Warner Brothers and old Scooby Doo cartoons as a kid, and just there's been this huge Western animation renaissance that passed me by. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, to, 
To be fair, I didn't start watching Avatar The Last Airbender until, like, the middle of book two of Korra was coming out, <laughs> so I was so late to the party of good Western cartoons. In a way, kind of me too. Uh, the weird thing is that for me, uh, I officially... I'd been... I'd always loved watching cartoons, even way past when I'm supposed, supposed to, according to some people, but... Uh, but, like, there was, like, this point, ironic, though ironically... It started around when Avatar started, which is bad timing for it, maybe. Uh, when cartoons were just starting to become shit. But I just, like, kept giving it a chance, kept trying to watch and enjoy the shows that there were. And while there was some good stuff, I just found myself increasingly distant to it and just watching anime instead, which, like, took things more seriously and treated me like an adult. Yeah, see, I discovered anime when I was about 12 and hit and transformed into a full-on weeb by age 13, so I don't think I watched any Western animation that wasn't Disney between the ages of about 13 and 19, and then I finally watched Avatar The Last Airbender for the first time and just started getting back into Western animation and going back to check out shows that people... Like, right now I'm getting quite into... I'm watching a lot of older DC animated shows that I've heard people saying were good for years, and I've just finally gotten around to actually watching them. Um, but yeah, in in, in modern car, in, uh, there's a lot of newer cartoons where you can see there's a lot of anime influence. Uh, not always for the best, it must be said. But you know there are in. I think you're right. That's in like the the story driven style, quite often that shows up. Um, not uh, not as much in the art style. The art style maybe a bit in Avatar, but in others, like Steven Universe, it is a lot of it's about the storytelling style. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say that. So there was, there was actually this series called Symbionic Titan, which was made by the creator of Samurai Jack. And I was in love with that series in particular, but, and actually, it should be pointed out, it's a mech show made by a Western animation god of sorts. And then a beloved, and at the same time that was airing, there was this Japanese anime called Tiger and Bunny, that was uh had a lot of Western superhero influence, which I thought was like this amazing contrast, and I was loving it. <laughs> but it, it kind of just showed how bad things had gone for cartoons for a while, because Symbiotic Titan was cancelled entirely because they couldn't get a toy line for their robot show. That actually That's happened. Pretty sad. And then, and then Tiger and Bunny, uh, unfortunately, was only popular enough to get three movies! <laughs> So I kind of saw where things were going for a while, even though there was some decent stuff like Adventure Time. I was just kind of done at that point. And then immediately when I was done, all the good stuff starts coming out. Of course. Just of course. (sighs) And then the last year I've discovered uh, Gravity Falls and Steven Universe and everything's been better. Yeah. Ugh. But when I actually started to properly watch it was, like, uh, I think Meme uh, was kind of really hoping I would watch it at some point, and so I just decided to watch the uh, first few episodes with her, uh, just out of curiosity, and I thought it was awesome. And, but then I decided to wait just a little bit longer, wait for Gravity Falls to end before pro- really diving into the series. So that is that. Okay, so, uh, I think, uh, what else did we say? Actually, um, what is the next thing we should talk about? Well, I mean, that's how we got into it and got through it. And Okay, so which one's your favorite? We should probably definitely hash out favorite characters at this point. Okay, favorite characters. Uh, obviously, well, my favorite character is definitely Pearl. She's the probably the most developed character she has. The most, in, just, uh, most consistently sad and tragic and slightly... <laughs> Depressing backstory. Easily. Yeah. Well, I mean, Amethyst gives her a run for her money yeah. sometimes when you get into but, the kindergarten. Yeah. But generally, Am- by and large, Amethyst is more positive about her life yeah. than Pearl is. Yeah, Pearl, it's... <laughs> I've said to you before when you were like... Well, you, you really, really like Pearl in the episodes that really focus on her sad story stuff. And I'm like, so every Pearl episode... <laughs> Basically. They never, they never stop. They never, they, like even the episodes that aren't about her, it, it still somehow always comes up. 
And I'm like, I just feel like, yeah, I just feel like that she's almost Byronic, you know, uh, she's like a female Byronic hero or something. Like she spends so much time brooding over her lost love interest, the woman she loved, but she's uh, she's this amazing warrior that is so much smarter and better than everyone. But spends so much time brooding over this dead woman she loved and just generally being angsty and sad. <laughs> yeah. But There's... thank God she actually smiles and actually cares about Stephen. <laughs> yeah, but uh, she's probably the perfect example just how far they can go with their character backstories and stories in general at points. Because there's just so, <laughs> there's so many layers to her and most of them are sad. <laughs> they're only getting sadder the more they peel them down. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff later in season two <laughs> where they're clearing up just what exactly the gems are to each other, and that's, you know, by and large, sentient tools, you know, and what pearls are, and how that relates to how she feels about Rose Quartz treating her like, a, you know, like an individual person who had the right to make some choices about her life rather than a decoration. You know, and they, yeah, it just gets sadder the more you unpack it. Yeah, she's she has so many issues, and they all just need therapists. <laughs> I think I think the uh, also I've said this to you before. I think one of the reasons I love it is that even though this her story kind of follows a similar path whenever they focus on her, they always do something interesting and different with it. So, like, it, it doesn't get old or repetitive at any point. It's like, oh, in this episode, she starts to blatantly reveal that she has... she thought a lot of Rose. And then in this episode, she goes on full breakdown mode. And then in this episode, she talks about how she was like a knight to her. And then in this episode, she has a nightmare. And then in this, it just goes on and on and on. Oh. Uh- Okay, I, well, the, the song in the episode where she's teaching Connie to fight is probably my second favorite song in the entire series. Because, I mean, for one, it's just good music, but also it yes. layers up her character so wonderfully and ha- and really lays out this very toxic mindset that she's conveying to Connie um, and how much that says about how she views herself. Yeah, that song is pretty brilliant. Like... I- I I, can't, I just love how epic it is too, like I love I do love how in this bright little kid show about this chubby little kid with his magical f- uh, moms that that this is like this song about how this little girl is gonna have to like is She's willing been to die to sacrifice her life <laughs> as a child soldier. Th- for, I also love the line yeah. about how what what was it uh. To think about their life after the war. <laughs> it's yeah. just like this so much seriousness and like life and it, death and situations. Then it gets so mentioned. domestic for a minute. I, I just love all of it. I also just love all the ballet and the way Pearl yes. is designed and the way she moves. And again, that's probably part of her being, you know, a, a decoration. She's a dancer, she's an entertainer. Um, but I love how that plays into her sword fighting. You know, I've just, like, any time she... I, I don't think I can... Like, at one point I started trying to spot her standing still in anything but, you know, one of the basic starting positions from ballet, which I did for years when I was a kid because it was inescapable. <laughs> and, you know, she's always standing in either one of the basic starting positions and the way she moves is a lot in... It's always very ba- um, ballet and it's very beautiful and it's just a wonderful bit of, like, animation and body language. And, you know, yeah. she weaponized it, because I, I never got very far in ballet because I just wasn't hardcore enough. And you need to be hardcore to especially go on point as much as she does when she's fighting. Damn. Yeah. Anyway, what? Uh, why don't you talk about your favorite character? Yeah, I got in on the Pearl fangirling, but actually Garnet is far and away my favorite. Like, she she tickles me because just <laughs> her deadpan delivery yes. of everything she says... Um, she's not my favorite, but you know, she is. She is the one I think is the most consistently hilarious. Yeah, she is. It's. I find Amethyst pretty funny too, but Garnet specifically hits my favorite style of comedy, and just also the fact that she acts very stoical, 
but then even while being stoical, she will totally go along with like Stephen's fantasies of what she did with her day, <laughs> or be yes. stoically standing there playing a game with Stephen or something. Like even when she doesn't facially emote very much, her affection for Stephen comes through very very strongly. I also just love the fact that she's probably the, she's far and away the most emotionally stable of the three crystal gems. Like that's that's not setting a very high bar, <laughs> but. She is basically a character who's already gone through most of her character development, and that's kind of why she's the leader and the mom to the other moms, and, you know, she is the stabilizing influence for the other characters. And I'm not saying I don't appreciate a good bit of angst, it's just, it is nice to have a mostly stable point character like that. And also because it means the breakdown moments she does have in season two, particularly when facing those fucking abominations in the kit like oh god those things were horrific but you know even when facing that it makes it hit very much harder and really helps emphasize how seriously horrific that situation is and also she is the physical manifestation of a stable happy and loving 5000 year old lesbian relationship i mean you know there are two ways to read the crystal gems like technically they're from a single gendered race that for as far as we can tell doesn't reproduce sexually so they are technically non-binary aliens, so, you know, three-quarters of your main cast are non-binary, that's wonderful. You can also read into the fact that they are clearly very heavily feminine-coded, and they all use feminine pronouns. So either that or three-quarters of your main cast is female. And either way, that's fantastic, and therefore Garnet is made of lesbians. <laughs> yes. And, and like I said, not all, not a lot to kiss on the lips, but they are able, because that still allows the network plausible deniability that they could still just, you know, they can tell homophobic parents that they could still just be gals being pals, you know, they're made out of the power of their friendship. But, I mean, does anybody with anything but the tightest heteronormative goggles on, like, see anything but a strong, loving lesbian relationship there? I find it hard to believe. It's a door, and, you know, they straight up even use the L word, they use the word love quite a lot, which is very, which is almost never used for platonic love in a lot of Western media. Yeah. I, I mean, I wish it was more. Um, but, you know, in this case, it's un, it's pretty much unambiguously romantic. She has a whole song about how she's literally made of love. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is my number one favorite song in the entire uh, series. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, 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 is, it is actually the best song. It is just the best made song. Uh, it just comes after a great reveal and just that lo- lovely line she has about how she's never alone. Because, like, she is two people, but she's one person, but she, yeah. I will say, crazy. I was able to eventually actually find a flaw with Stronger Than You. And this might just annoy Lies. me. Lies. But the, during the second uh, go around with the chorus, she says to try to hit her if you're able, and then Jar- and then Jasper is able to hit her. Fail! You fool! That that is a fail. Like that should not have happened. <laughs> that, that that just makes. He doesn't look, seem too uh, fussed by getting hit, though. Uh, fair enough. That, 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 that just kind of annoys me. Like, why don't she just just pit you? Whoops. <laughs> I just want to uh, sideline that it's hitting me very powerfully emotionally that this is actually on to you know. There's this very strong, unambiguously romantic relationship between Ruby and Sapphire. Even it get you know it gets even less ambiguous when the answer comes around. There's clearly a lot of romantic affection in Pearl for Rose Quartz, so that's much sadder. Yeah. And I just it hits me very powerful because I remember I think I was about I must have been about twelve. Uh, I think I was about thirteen when Doctor Who came back on with Christopher Eccleston, and when it introduced the captor of character Captain Jack Harkness, that was the first time the entire concept of bisexuality entered my life. And this was after a bit more than a year of me having this huge identity crisis because I had a crush on my girl on my hockey team and I wasn't sure if I was a lesbian or not. And I had all this internalized toxic shit about being gay that was fueling a lot of self-hate if I was. And then, you know, I think that particular male actor or classmate is attractive, so maybe I'm not, but maybe I am. But, you know, anyone who says bisexuals are confused... No, we're confused until we find out what bisexuality is. Trust me. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, that was a huge revelation, especially because the way it was presented, like, overall, Jack Harkness isn't isn't necessarily good bisexual representation because he's very heavily embodies that stereotype of all bisexuals are promiscuous. And, you know, technically he's more pansexual than bisexual. But 
just at the time the fact that he existed and the fact that the doctor your cent at the time was your central heroic character was you know completely chill and didn't get and was like no oh, why are you freaking out about it you know it's a completely normal fu- thing that's fine you're going to be shagging aliens in the future why are you worried about genders you know but this was back when doctor who was really good uh, <laughs> That was just a very powerful thing for me. And if I'd ever seen anything like this on TV when I was a little girl, I would not have spent any time just, you know, for one thing, non-sexualized, positive, romantic relationships between two women would go a lot, a long way towards getting rid of some toxic shit about automatically sexualizing gay relationships, you know, mm-hmm. which ma- which is goes a long way to making them feel wrong. When you're just, you know, when you're at that age, you've just learned about sex, and it's still a bit ew. Um, but just also, I mean, Cora, particular, unambiguously bisexual, would have changed my entire life. But even just, you know, unambiguously romantic, positive, nice relationships between two women. Just, I'm so happy for little kid for little kids who are seeing that now. Yeah, that and is awesome. It's, you know. Dealing with homophobic parents, still a pile of shit. They still exist, unfortunately, but, you know, seeing better representations through media is one way out of that, and one way to learn about it. So, that you know, I go off on a sideline of reasons why Garnet hits me very emotionally powerfully, but, yeah. Also, I have a massive crush on her, because she's gorgeous and she has <laughs> such a beautiful voice. So, there's that. <laughs> Yeah. I know there's a, the, a lot of other people have also talked about how they like a lot of the a lot of the visual coding for most of the gems is very much not white. I'm too white to talk about that with authority, <laughs> so I'm not going to. But I am just going to say it's amazing how many num- how many um, POC, especially women, are working on this show. And you know, it's directed by. Isn't this something like the first? show on Nickelodeon or, or Cartoon Network or something that's directed by a woman? No, I don't think so. No, that, that actually that happened recently with uh, Star vs. the Forces of Evil was the first female-led anime show on Disney. But I'm not sure about the... Uh, I don't think so because uh, there had to have been other ones on Cartoon Network, right? I see Lauren Foss was on there for a while. But I think she's oh, just I'm just looking on Rebecca Sugar's page, and it's oh, she's the first woman to create to independently create a series for Cartoon Network. Uh, independent. Oh yeah, because uh, Lauren Foster, uh, Lauren Foster, whatever her name is, uh, worked on uh, worked with Craig McCracken on uh, Foster's Home. I remember that. So yeah, but they the the two work together. So that that independently, I can buy that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, back to back to solely focusing on what's in Steven Universe. Now we already talked about our best songs. I I do love how music is used in this show. Yeah, just like it's casual, you know, pretty. casual random music numbers that are always really really good. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple that were just kind of meh. Like I immediately think of that uh, Amethyst song from that one episode where the s- Sardonyx, and like yeah. I, I didn't really. It was that didn't add much for me, yeah. <laughs> but me for the most part they're very good. Though I'm reminded of that one time where Greg, Greg sang a song and he's like, eh, "It's B side." <laughs> <laughs> that was that was really funny, <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> That's what makes it awesome. <laughs> that the whole song, that whole song is amazing just for that one line. Uh, that that was so good. <laughs> But yeah, there are a bunch of cool, uh, um, there's just a bunch of really awesome characters. Like, I I think the side characters kind of are a bit underdeveloped by comparison, but most of them are fine. Uh, though, like, basically once you get past, like, the main six, seven characters, there's there is a pretty quick drop-off. Yeah. It's like, they're I mean, fine, I, but... It, it probably doesn't help that a lot of them don't appear very often. Like, aside from the main cast, you'll go a long time without seeing, you know... Um, Has, what the, when's the last time Lars has even done anything? I just realized. <laughs> yeah, you'll go a long time without seeing Sadie and Lars, or 
the whole pizza shop family who I love yeah. every single one of them but you know most of them don't turn up for very long stretches so it's probably why they're a lot underdeveloped compared to say the Crystal Gems Steve and Greg and Connie yeah especially because there's a lot more focus on the Crystal Gems and their relationship with Homeworld Gems it's because yeah. they've been building up to all the reveals about Homeworld and how that all works I feel like the series figured out that it got something a lot more interesting and it was like yeah, we still have side characters, but that's not really the focus anymore. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically around the time, like, Paradox show- started showing up, the, the side cast just started to just drop in relevance. <laughs> well, I mean, they, je- they actually sent them out into a barn in the middle of nowhere to build a space, <laughs> uh, to build a drill, just so they're basically not interacting with any of the side cast. <laughs> yeah, I will say that's, that's one of those things where I'm like, I... <laughs> I kind of feel bad saying this, but I almost feel like the stuff the series focuses on, it's so good at that it kind of almost hurts everything now. Like, (laughs) the series is just so good at the things it focuses on that the series is almost not as good as it should be because it's too good. (laughs) Because it's... Because the other stuff, it just... Because when it just... Because when things don't work, it just shows so much more. It it sets a very high bar for them yeah. for itself. So if it does slip sometimes in characterization, when it does, it's all the more glaring because of how good it is the rest of the yeah. time. Yeah, like compared to like uh, Gravity Falls, Gravity Falls, while it tries for more than most animated series, it does not try for the levels that Steven Universe does at times. But that also means when it does something kind of dumb, it and because it's much more focused on its comedy, it's kind of easier to just not care, <laughs> instead of being actively annoyed by it. I mean, I feel I, f- I feel like it's hard to say given the show's separ- uh, given the show's premises, but I feel like Gravity Falls is a lot more inherently surreal than Steven yeah. Universe, or maybe not. Given it's, you know, it's more inherently cipher. silly for the sake of being silly. Yeah. It, like that, you kind of know that going in. Whereas, like Steven Universe, is like, I I think like by the second season, it's almost almost like only half a comedy now. I was gonna say I hesitate to call it serious because it is so funny all the time. Yeah, but it's, it's also dramedy. It go it goes in for a lot less absurdity in its comedy. Yeah, it's a little more toned down outside of certain exceptions. Yeah. Honestly, while we're ranting about things, because I'm never going to get a chance to rant about this again. Because it's just something I've noticed recently, and I've noticed for other series, and it does, it really annoys me when people bring this up. But, while I get why, I really don't like it when people suggest to start in the middle of a series, especially for a series like this. Because, oh, because cool stuff happens at this episode, and then the plot gets going, and that's what matters. I'm like, but they spent so much time setting up the characters in the world before it starts. Yes, yeah, I, the point. I am one of those obsessive people who, if I want to watch something, I want to go right back to the start. Yeah. I don't want to start in the middle. Even if that's where you... I think, like, like you said, it might be where they perceive it as getting good, but maybe you no, need all of the characterization and world-building set up before you drop yourself in the middle of it. Like, you know, again, I keep telling people about Legend of Korra. I know a lot of people aren't into books one and two. Books three and four are where it gets incredibly good, but please don't just skip one and two. Yeah. Although no one would blame me if you skip one, because the series itself does after a while. I I, I feel really sorry for the producers of Legend of Korra, because they did such a good job with The Last Airbender, because they knew ahead of time exactly how much they had. Whereas Legend of Korra is a bit more touch and go because they didn't go in with a pre-planned number of seasons, yeah. and I I feel like it could have been a lot better than it was had they known. But as it is, it's still you know easily one of the best modern Western cartoons. I hate when people do that sometimes because it's like like they set up the characters like the reason you care about the series is set up before the plot starts. Yeah, you could just be like, oh, plot happens with characters I don't know or care about. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, I mean, I will say, again, a bit like the Avatar thing, I'm very excited that Steven Universe has been renewed for, like, up to season five, yeah. I think. Because I just, 
I know, I have faith that Rebecca Sugar is going to do good shit knowing she's got that much ahead of her to work with. Yeah, that's that's a good sign. Uh, although originally we thought it was even longer than it was. Yeah. Because it was like, well, season one was 52 episodes, so... Uh, what? Yeah, then they, deci- then they decide that basically season two is just the Stephen Bombs and the new the new episodes starting soon of season three. Yeah. Which, to be fair, makes more sense. It's just weird. It has made this... The, the Stephen Bombs have been a little messy in terms of, like, coherent plot between them because of the weird release dates. I mean, they've all been very, very good episodes individually. It just maybe doesn't have quite the overall coherency that season one does, you know? Yeah, I can see that. Uh... I will say I would still prefer that to just airing one episode a week, because I I really t- I don't like that idea. Just only eleven minutes a week, like no, I I need more. I'm just personally I'm already done with like network scheduling era of TV. Can we please yes. just you know I I am ready for the future of you know Netflix and Amazon Prime and just give me a whole season to binge watch. Yeah, that's, you know, that could also work. Because, I mean, aside from anything else, it makes it so much more accessible to people who want to watch it than... I mean, it's easier than it's ever been to record shows that, aren't, that are on when you're out at work or whatever. But just, you know, even if you're not putting up a whole season at a time, just put it online, because then you can get... Then it's more easy for people in other countries to watch it, and it's e- unless you're an asshole who locks your website to the US, Nickelodeon... Um, you know, or it makes it makes it easier for people to watch, and then guess what? You get more views, and you get more of that sweet, sweet ad revenue off the side of the screen. Yes, that's the best idea. I mean, anything's better than what networks have. Networks don't even air shows like Logical Human Beings anymore. Like, literally outside of anime, no one does that anymore, it seems. Anime is at least simple. You have a season, and then you have an episode every week, and then the season ends. I, I understand that, at least. I can follow that. I, I know what's going on. But also, if you're producing your shows, you know... I mean, the thing Netflix has already hit on is that when you're posting stuff online, you're not battling for slots, time slots, and you're not playing demographics politics. Which, like... Oh, I... I could talk a lot about demographics, politics, and Western media, but I'm not going to. We're talking about a Western um, animated I'm just cartoons say that I as 20-year-olds, so... I th- think I'm going to say demographics, politics are the main reason that Ruby and Sapphire and Cora and Asami are not allowed to kiss. Yeah. And I hate it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of shows that are... Most Netflix original shows are shows that would never have gotten a time slot on TV, but are incredibly good shows. Sounds about right. So. So this is a long way of saying that I don't have any cartoons on my TV anymore because everyone in my house is an adult and none of us are buying cartoon channels. Please let me watch Steven Universe legally online. <laughs> I just don't watch TV anymore. <laughs> now that was my simple answer. Not watching TV. As of Toonami sometimes. That's it. But however I find it, I am looking forward to the next season of Steven Universe because they have set up... You know, they've set up all the horrifying implications of what Homeworld Gem society is like, and they've set up a... and they've got us waiting for Yellow Diamond to show up and fuck shit up. Because, like, you kind of you kind of knew when, um... Jay... Uh, Jasper. Why, why was I going to call her Jade? Jasper well, Jade is Amethyst- a sort of gem, I guess. We don't have one of those yet. But when Jasper and Amethyst showed up, you kind of got a hint... That they were a part of something much worse just by the shape of their ship. It's just a hand. I mean, was I the only one? I mean, my brain immediately went to space balls <laughs> and the giant planet sucking, you know, made spaceship. But there is just that implication of if that ship's shaped like a hand, where's the rest of it and how big is it? You know. And the fa- and they did bring up Yellow Diamond as their boss in that. And then, you know, you actually get to see her, and her face when Amethyst calls her Claude is the greatest and best thing. Yes. <laughs> but she's also clearly very dangerous, and, uh, you know, Peridot is terrified of her. It sounds like, she, you know, she sounds like she might be in charge of some sort of military division of Homeworld. We don't really know that for sure, we just have theories. But, 
when she shows up, it you know the fighting's going to be serious. Yes. And I feel like we're going to learn a lot of interesting things about just the what the upper levels of gem society are like and how rose quartz fit into all that. I'm I'm gonna actually I do have a few theories. Uh, uh, one of which is I'm I'm gonna take a guess that Rose used to be a pretty higher up in the system, but then just saw the error of just saw how horrible things were. That's my guess. Like maybe not diamond level, but like maybe like right below one of them or something. Well, I don't know because a lot of people have caught um like some of the murals that have been found in ships in some episodes, most recently the one where they went to see that map of the world and just background murals of four major figures, three of whom have been identified just from the way they're drawn in their colour schemes as rose quartz yellow diamond and blue diamond and there's a fourth one in white who has, not you know, general theories that are that she's white diamond because themes um but they seem to, the four of them seem to have been major figures in gem society enough that, of, you know, of all the ships that have land, that are still on Earth from the gem war 5,000 years ago, the four of them are depicted in their major artwork and so on. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. And it's heavily implied that the gems regularly destroy entire planets with creating new gems, I guess, to, you know, just tearing them to shreds to create gems. Yeah. And... Possibly they hadn't dealt with one with as much organic life as Earth before. I mean, statistically speaking, the majority of plants in the universe are barren, so they might just. So there is a chance that they just hadn't encountered a planet with organic life the way Earth has before, and Rose Quartz found herself fascinated by it, by, you know, these sentient, sentient beings that reproduced in ways other than tearing a planet in half. You know, that. They, all things green and growing. Like she's mentioned, of, she she clearly has a big thing with plants, you know, plants and flowers and um, flora. But she also mentioned just um, being amazed by humans and animals, and all living things. So whatever the reason, she decided that it, destroying whatever this was wasn't worth building new gems, and that's how she set to defending the Earth from homeworld. That's my theory. It's a pretty good theory. Uh... It's a very good theory. Probably better than my and theory. That, yeah. Yeah. And that also seems to have led to her ways of thinking that weren't accepted on Homeworld. Like, you know, maybe a pearl can choose to be something other than a pretty decoration. Yeah. Uh, maybe two gem, maybe two different gems, if they can fuse and they want to fuse and they're happy and stable fusing, that's okay. I don't... Oh, God. I could talk for... I could spend a whole episode talking about everything I love about the answer and what it represents about you know, narratives about love and especially you know, it's very heavily coded queer love, not just because they're both female but the way the gems on blue diamonds shit react yeah. is like disgusting. Two beings it, this is two, two different types of beings together? How how ridiculous. Yeah. I, that's <laughs> so still weird. awesome. That's the spital taboo. Uh, and just, every, I love everything about fusion as a metaphor for relationships. It's so well used yes. as a metaphor, particularly when talking about you know consent. Uh huh. Speaking of which, can we talk about our favorite episodes now? Go for it. Okay, so my favorite episode, not just of Steven Universe, but of any show, is Alone Together, which to me is just about as perfect a mixture of. I guess, literal and metaphorical story as you can get with the exact right characters and story and ideas you would want for it. <laughs> I can literally not think of a better 11-minute episode one could make. It is so, 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 so good. It should, it should be used for many college essays. Oh, God, I so hope people are... You know, I know people on the internet are writing forever about... Steven Universe, but I really hope it's getting some academic recognition with what it does. Yes, and absolutely, especially with episodes like that. Because, like, I'm not even joking, like, I'm... I don't, I do not pretend to be the smartest person when trying to figure out the more subtle elements in a series. But personally, I cannot think of a better example that matched, that mixed together both 
a literal and metaphorical story like this and did it this well. At the I very mean, it's, least, in it's terms especially of the TV good. Show. Wa- it's especially fun to watch after knowing about Garnet because her response <laughs> yes. just either, the, just I mean, first off, the massive grin on her face. <laughs> She's so happy. So I mean, yeah, she she's like a mom seeing her son with his foot getting watching her son get married or something. You know, she's so happy. I know. I just so I happy. literally just thought of this. I do think it's, it is pretty fitting that considering how she was, a, presumably apparently, the first non same fusion, that she would be interested in the first non purely gem fusion. Yeah, she's probably pretty and proud she of that. She wanted to be so supportive to them from the off instead of giving them, instead of letting anyone give them the shit yeah. she got when she first fused. Yeah, and it does, and of course, one of the what has to be a recurring theory because it's the obvious thing to do is that we're gonna see a lot more of St- Kick-Ass fighting Stevani. I so want Stevani, yeah. Stevani with you know. Steven Shield and Connie Sword. You know, I was trying to think of a lot for a long time. If there was any way they could ever properly follow up on Lone Together. And I think this is a pretty good idea. By putting them in a situation that is not a purely emotional episode and just having them be awesome badass. Yes. So but just have them be awesome in an entirely different way. So it's like... Because I don't think you could... I really have no idea how you would follow up like, do a, follow, a direct, similar type of follow-up story for that. So just put them in a different situation where they could be awesome. But still have that, the interesting things, like, underlining it or whatever. That seems like the best idea to go forward with. I also like, I mean, on the one hand, it is a little weird that there's several... I mean, they don't make it two eggs. It's mostly older teenage characters swooning over Stavoni's beauty. Yeah. Even though they're, they're made out of two 14 year olds. Yeah. What, what definitely would have been weird if adults have been involved in that, but it all seems to be older teenagers, yeah. so it's not really that weird. And I do like that just this physical representation of Connie and Steve's relationship is so beautiful. <laughs> yes. You know? And also, and, and, and also, apparently, either makes people gay or everyone in this world is bi. Well, or something. explicitly <laughs> non-binary, so therefore everyone is gay for Steve. Yes. <laughs> Th- that, that's lovely. They're a combination of both genders, so everyone's <laughs> fine with it. Yep. And yeah, it it also the episode also has a really good visual representation of what a panic attack feels like. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. Oh boy. And it just you know, they panic but they're also they're not alone. Like even when they split apart, they're still together. Yeah. And they can still hang out and <laughs> Well it seems out, like in some ways they lovely. kinda of preferred it that way towards the end. Yeah, I mean they're like, uh, about- maybe there's a drawback to this. Everything about Stephen and Connie's relationship is just so adorable. And yes, yeah, it absolutely is. The it was lovely. And again, it's for some reasons that my favorite episode is The Answer. That became my favorite very, very yeah. fast. I think I watched it like eight or nine times in a row when it first came out. And I just love everything from the artistic choices yeah. in the flashback. You know, the flat palettes on Homeworld versus the more nuanced colors on Earth. Just the the way that Ruby and Sapphire again explicitly referred to as love. Yeah. You know, they they could have danced about it at the end saying you already are the answer and then they straight yeah. up have gone and confirmed the answer was love. Yeah. But, you know, I, I actually have to we have to give the series credit for this cuz think of how many times that would be that would just be a really dumb cheesy line. The answer is love. But they actually made it but the series is good enough that actually makes it work. Yeah. I mean, it helps that it is kind of a, a cheesy, hyper-excited boy going, what was the answer? Love. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Oh, that's it's great. Just, it's just her telling him this very personal story, but she's so happy while she's telling him. Because even though, you know, parts of it have to be traumatic for her, especially remembering Homeworld Jim's response and all the uncertainty and fear that Ruby and Sapphire went through, She's so happy and content in herself now. And this, you know, little boy adopted son that she loves so much loves her so much for what she is. And it just, oh, yeah. it gives me feelings. Uh, and I also just particularly love the song that Ruby and Sapphire sing together. It's probably my third favorite in the series. And it just always gives me, like, little happy shivers when the bars from Sh- from Stronger Than You come in towards <laughs> the end. Yeah, that that's a really nice touch. Uh, it, yeah, it's a great yeah. And just going at the first couple of times she fuses is so cute. Yeah. 
like cotton candy. <laughs> cotton candy here. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's great. I'm kind of interested in why. I'm kind of interested. I have to assume the reason why her appearance changed after a while is because her fusion became more stable and consistent. Yeah. And more permanent. She became more assured of herself, probably got a bit more control over what she looked like when she fused. And just. Yeah, was was less confused and frightened and uncertain in herself. I also love the fact. I, I also just I keep telling people this, like when they start watching that when they get to season two, they will hear the phrase "terrifying renegade pearl" <laughs> said entirely unironically. <laughs> yes, and it is in context. But I mean, I know I mentioned this to you already, but I did see someone um, say that actually, to homeworld gems, pearl probably is terrifying because she's as if you have a decorative vase that suddenly picked up a sword and started killing people. <laughs> Which you know. would be awesome. And it's it's wonderful. I just Our precious dorky Pearl is such an object of terror simply by breaking this rule that was assigned to her. Mm-hmm. And just I, I love the beginning of this whole Island of Misfit Toys dynamic that Rose clearly has with Pearl and Garnet. <laughs> but I also worry that there had to have been more gems involved. Yeah. Like, one, you know, when they we aren't seeing all the ones all- that died. <laughs> All the many, many, many ones that died. They have referred to lots of gems dying in the war on both sides. I mean, we saw the so kindergarten, just... and there none of those gems were still around. I think that says a lot. Like, also when um, they find the abominations underground, Garnet does seem like she recognizes some of the gems that are making the one that, you know, you briefly see four feminine shapes coming out of it before it forms into just a mess of arms and yeah. shit. And Garnet Met says this is the punish uh, our punishment for the rebellion, <laughs> which may imply that other rebel gems were made into those abominations out of broken shards, which is just oh so ho- just oh so horrific on so many levels. Okay, uh, before we end this off, let's just rant about some other awesome episodes. Uh, my second favorite episode is Sworn to the Sword. It is basically everything yes. good, and I want to see. Like it is like there's like a perfect combination of things I want to see in the series. I, I first of all, I love when it's done well. I love stories about the normal characters becoming a lot stronger and starting to enter the fight with all the other magical creatures and such. Yeah. So seeing Connie with a sword is awesome, and I just love. I love. Uh, I also love stories with like young young children having to take up swords and stuff like this. Just awesome. I I do like how this episode also highlighted the uncomfortable aspect that you don't think about a lot in shows that are aimed in children about children fighting. <laughs> yeah. That just it it does low key highlight the issue that Connie is being trained as a child soldier. Yes. Basically. And that pearls in in pearls infecting her with all her bad ideas. Yeah, and I do love how Steven jumps into immediately like, fight no, that no, mindset no. that she should be prepared to die for him. Yeah. When, you know, she's his friend. They want to fight together. Yeah. I find it both believable and not that Connie kind of just went all out with this so quickly. Because on one hand, it is a bit silly that she would immediately like, yes, I put my life on the line for someone at the age of 12. But on the other hand, it she does seem like because she doesn't have a lot of friends and hasn't had a lot of friends, or any. It seems like because she considers herself so close to Stephen that she would just do anything for him if asked. Also, I mean, the song does include a montage that indicates significant passage of time. So yeah, if Connie's treating too. with Pearl for a long time, and Pearl is drilling in her in this, in her um, idea of chivalry the yeah. whole time. To me, that's then, to me that's sort of the saving grace of that episode. I think I would have had a lot more problems with that episode if it wasn't for the passage of time. Yeah. But the episode's great. Everything's about it's great. Like I love how it connected it all back to Rose still and Pearl's never-ending failures and misery. I I have a hard time identifying a particular second favorite episode. Like the finale of season one particularly yeah. springs to mind. But one I really do want to talk about is Future Vision. Oh yeah, that that one. I I'll I'll be. I'll be perfectly honest. It's it's a good episode. I I'm not sure I I'm not sure I understand why it's one of the best though. It's I mean it's very it ends up being very focused on Stephen and Garnet's relationship, which is you know Garnet's my favorite. Yeah. I love her. Um, I am also one of those people who's always interested in stories that deal with like 
time travel in alternate universes, and there is a bit of that here, with basically Steven being able to consciously hop through alternate potential timelines until he finds the one, the good one. Um, and just him dealing with realizing all the horrible potential things that could happen <laughs> every second. All the hilarious just, horrible things. <laughs> I I think the first time I actually cried watching Steven Universe was at the climax of this episode when Woke come off the roof and Garnet apologizes for sharing her future vision, knowing that it's what's frightened him, and she tells him, I see so many things that can hurt you, I should never have let one of them be me. And Oh like I was talking about at the beginning felt like a physical impact from that line. <laughs> but just also, it's one of those things that gets more painful the more you think about it, because then you realize Garnet is probably full-time repeatedly experiencing the deaths and just the horrible things happening to everyone she cares about, and just redoing things over and over and over until she gets like the good time. So basically, so basically she's Steingating everything. More or less. I mean, without screwing up the timeline that badly. <laughs> but, and no, bananas are involved. Sadly. But, you know. But, I mean, she does say, I see so many things that could hurt you. Which means that she is seeing Steven get hurt and die on a very regular basis. Yeah. But, I, and I just, I love the fact that she took, she she did see the potential of fighting him, but she wanted to take the risk anyway because she wanted to feel closer to him. Because she wanted him to understand her a little more. Yeah. And... But- I, oh, just everything about that has so many feelings for me, and the fact that at the end, yeah, it, it it works. They're very very close at the end. It pays off at the end of season one when she gives him a bit of future vision to help him find the other gem. Yeah, I just it makes me love Garnet so so much for everything she chooses to be. Well, this is uh, this is going a bit long, so let's rapid fire any other awesome episodes. All of them. Well, no, <laughs> okay, but just try to keep it to like, let's say like, just a few each. Uh, first of all, uh, actually, I want to highlight uh, certain episodes that aren't super plot relevant, but I still think are awesome. Space Race, that episode's awesome. Yeah. Just love seeing Pearl being all scientific, and I just love how cheerful she is, just trying to get all this to get this rocket ship ready. But she's still, still so so desperate to try to. Actually, that is yeah. a bit weird. Like, I think that's the only time. I think that's the only time that she was really that sad about not being home. I also, I cannot, I don't know why the episode title has slipped my brain, but the one where Steven finds out that he is healing spit. Uh, indirect like, kiss. Yes, indirect that, kiss. That episode's great because it's like a bunch of little mini advancements in plots, and they all just tie together yeah. super well. I, I particularly love the stuff where Steven's musing on his feelings or lack thereof about his dead mom yeah. that he never knew. You know, it's especially when he's complaining about the fact that he can't cry about her. I, I mean, how often do you see, you know, young male protagonists being encouraged to cry and be open about their feelings? That is always a good thing. Like, yes, it is. Presenting crying as a good, healthy thing to do. I love that. Um, and just also <laughs> the the moment where he thinks it was his desperation that finally did it, and going and pull just like, well, it could have been us destroying the thorns at the other end. But yeah, sure, you did it, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, the, that joke's great because it's just it's just Stephen putting what his like anger towards their attitude afterwards, where he's like, no, Stephen, you don't have any magical powers. It's like, <laughs> did that really happen? No, but it might as well have. Oh, oh poor Steve. I did once see a really great writer's list of ways of showing intimacy between characters in non-romantic, and not necessarily romantic ways, and one of them is sharing food. <laughs> and, you know, you have Stephen and Connie sharing this juice. And that is just one of those little gestures that, I, I mean, I do think they're adorable as, you know, a tiny baby couple. <laughs> but it is also just a very, it, it is one of those great, not necessarily romantic ways of showing trust and, you know, intimate affection between two people is sharing food. So that was adorable. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. Garnet's universe is awesome. <laughs> that episode is so <laughs> that is, awesome. That is one of those ones I was talking about where, you know, Garnet doesn't seem to be visibly emoting her much, <laughs> much, but she's just so cheerfully going along with Stephen's imagination of what's happened. Yeah. To be honest, I think that episode is partially just a dumb adventure, but it's just... 
it's my type of dumb. It's yeah. my type of dumb anime fun. So it made me happy to see. And I do like low callbacks to how Steven sees it. Like, how she keeps looking at the picture of Steven. Yeah. <laughs> or like, I can't, I can't tell, I can't tell him yet that I have awesome animal friends. <laughs> I, I like most of the recent episodes with Peridot for a lot of reasons. <laughs> yes. Like, I, I always enjoy Zuko arcs is what I call it when the villain turns into the awkward family member. Yeah. Uh, just the the thing she's learning about this new society yeah. that she's now part of and the way a lot of that... Especially Partic- the last two episodes particularly of go- yeah. Particularly, her discovering shipping is fun <laughs> on every level. Yes, that, I was about to say, like, uh, what's it called? Log date 7152, I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> that's quickly become... That's probably become one of my favorite episodes. That might be my favorite comedy episode. So many good jokes in that. I feel like it's more of an affectionate parody of that kind of fanish behavior. Yeah. Like, it's not maliciously mocking that kind Probably of Probably not. I mean, it's, it's funny um, by well, taking not to a certain extreme. Least. But yeah, but it's also, part of it is that it's not necessarily mocking it because then later Garnet uses Peridot's ship to explain shipping, uh, to explain her fusion I think the series is just saying that it can be a bit silly, but that's okay. It's a bit silly, but it's also, like, using it for this positive development in Peridot's life, which is great. And I love, you know, Garner offering to fuse with Peridot (laughs) to help her understand it. Just because the scene is so heavily subtext (laughs) is, like... um, When is it? I don't even need to... The, the subject of the scene is very much Peridot's response is very much like she's just been asked out on a date or something. Yeah, I, I actually, the first thing that comes to mind is like a girl who's maybe not quite sure of her sexuality being asked out on, on a semi-friendly date with another girl just to see how she feels about it. And then she backs out when she's uncomfortable. And Garnet's fine with that. She's like, it's okay. You don't have to do anything you're uncomfortable with. Um, you know, you tried and that's a big step forward for you. So, you know, I adore... I mean, like I said... Fusions is a metaphor for relationships and particularly sex. I just adore on every single level, and that was one a good rep- and that was a good example of how they use that representation well. Yeah, they did. I think they did everything well in that episode. It's great. Yeah. Line the mood. <laughs> that's that's one of the all-time great bad puns. I love it. The series loves its bad puns, but that was masterclass of it. I mean, there's, there's so much more I love about this series, but I feel like we'll get chances to talk about more specific aspects when we start doing season three vlogs. Yeah, we certainly will. Uh, so that airs... I'm going to say one week from now, but it's probably going to be even sooner by the time I put this up. It might even be, like, tomorrow by the time this goes up. We'll see you when... around the time the new episode is out, and we'll talk about that. I think, actually, I think two episodes are airing on the same day to start this. So that'll be cool. Nice. So that's about it. I'll see you all for season three. Yes, yeah, see you there. Goodbye.